Hi guys. Um, we're going to cover the Rethinks Robotics Analysis um, using the Altair toolset um, to be able to design uh, mechanical robotics. And we're going to talk about the structural and um, mechanical issues that can arise with the uh, robotics um, design. And um, so that's what we're going to be covering. We're going to be starting with a um, presentation, which I'm going to do, which is going to be a PowerPoint. Uh, and then after that, Ali, the application engineer, shall be uh, doing a presentation using this, some of the software that I'm discussing in here to demonstrate how you'd actually use um, some of the Altair products to actually uh, do some analysis on robotics. So first of all, let's talk about some of the structural challenges that can happen in robotics design. Um, first of all, when we're talking about robotics, the cost of the robot is um, coming down in price significantly, um, you know, especially with the uh, advent of um, increased algorithms. Um, however, the uh, the uh, actual robotics structure itself actually can end up costing quite a bit. Um, people buy robotics arm off the shelf. Um, they'll buy effectors off the shelf, but sometimes they'll customize part of the robot or they'll customize the end effector in order to um, uh, lighten the load or uh, be able to make uh, different functions of the robot and also even the base of the robot um, can have structural components as well. So what we're talking about is power as a consideration. Um, speed oftentimes in high speed applications is usually a big deal. Accuracy, so sometimes when you're dealing with um, placement um, or pick and place situations, um, the accuracy um, and sometimes even if the workloads are large, the strength of the robotics is a, is a big deal. When it comes down to it, really what we're talking about is the overall weight makes a huge difference in the actual robotics design. So let's get into um, basically looking at how Altair approaches um, their uh, uh, future uh, view of um, analysis in the future. So in the traditional approach, typically what you would do is you would design um, the uh, robotic the first time, and then you might do one design iteration, and then you'd move towards validation. Uh, the, in, the problem sometimes with that is that the validation can end up having, once you're designed the robotics or the design doesn't work, so then you have to go back to the drawing board and start over. So the whole idea is to be able to do some conceptual analysis to do some different tests or case studies in the beginning to see if there are different concepts that might work up front. So when we're looking at like um, examples of um, doing iteration, one is that uh, Altair offers is SimSolid. It's a very fast solver for doing um, analysis. Basically it uh, will do a geometry evaluation without having to uh, do any modifications of your geometry or your CAD models. It will do um, a, a solved solution using adaptive um, meshing or adaptive solving and then using an error analysis it will um, refine the results um, towards the end. Uh, why would SimSolid be a good example? Um, one is uh, you eliminate geometry simplification, so you don't have to worry about removing bolts, removing holes, modifying geometry so the mesh works. It will basically identify different features such as welds, bolts, um, uh, or other types of joints and automatically create those connections automatically. And because this is very um, quick, it's able to analyze large assemblies um, and connect them very quickly, literally within seconds to minutes. Um, so you're able to get those results very quickly and then you could iterate another different concept and then get another result and compare. Um, again, traditional FEA meshing, um, you're probably familiar with, like sometimes you end up with like uh, thin walled parts, which sometimes can be a difficult or small geometry features. Another thing that I've encountered is sometimes part gaps or overlaps of CAD sometimes can cause the meshes to crash, so it'll actually identify those and create those connections. Um, you can end up with uh, weird geometry, such as small splinter faces or transitions. And the really impressive part is for more complex parts, which is where robotics is moving towards uh, 3D printing. 
when you're looking at 3D printing. You can really increase the geometry complexity. As you can see there, for example, there's a lattice structure, which is quite a light structure, and uh, it's able to analyze um, very small geometry. Uh, so using robotics for Altair, um, you can simulate your robotic arm within minutes and compare various designs. Um, for example, here's a robotic arm. You have two separate positions. Um, you can compare those positions and see what kind of maybe resonances you're getting or stresses or displacements. Another example is Altair Inspire. This is more of an optimization example. But uh, the whole idea is that uh, instead of actually coming up with the design, it will actually make suggestions for you. So, for example, when we're looking at simulation-driven design, um, you create and modify designs. Um, so the idea is to do generative design um, by putting in the uh, load conditions in the uh, m loading space. And then once you come up with a uh, suggested design that you like, you can simulate in the same space. And then after that, optimize those parts for manufacturing. So for example, say you were to optimize a end effector, it would actually come up with the shape for you. You could simulate in the environment. And then after that, you could choose which manufacturing method you want to use. For example, injection molding. You could use uh, in, uh, CNC um, machining, 3D printing, or laser cutting. And the nice part as well in, um, in Inspires, there's a very uh, good mechanism or motions analysis. So we'll actually optimize the parts based on all the loading conditions using dynamics analysis and loads. So um, it's really popular for doing um, uh, different types of mechanisms, which is very common in robotics. Uh, you know, the idea behind robotic simulation and optimization for Inspire is um, you can run the simulation for motion inside Inspire. You can extract those loaded conditions and then you can optimize the robotic arm using Inspire. So you'll notice, for example, there there's a couple arms that are um, have a little lattice or a, uh, like a structural element to them and they look quite lightweight and that was all basically um, those shapes came or come up with using Altair Inspire. Anyways, um, I think I've spoken enough. What I'm going to do is let Ali uh, really show the magic and show you some examples of how you can use this type of uh, software or design approach to be able to come up with um, more efficient um, robotics and be able to identify areas that could be improved. Thank you. Initially, I'll be going through the presentation of the softwares. Then we will have a short Q&A uh, section in which if you have any questions, you can, you know, uh, reach out to me and ask me directly. So I'll just share my screen. All right. So basically, I'll be starting with the SimSolid. Then we'll be moving uh, towards the optimization part. Here, we'll be analyzing a robotics, right? So I'll just quickly go ahead and load up a model. Okay. So a uh, robot model I have just loaded up. It will you know, try to identify different parts in here. The SimSolid is always quite unique, right? It's try to identify what are the different components within the solid body. So here I have uh, you know, imported the model. And in the assembly, if I go, it has smartly identified different kind of parts. If there are any you know, nuts and bolts, it has also identified those as well, right? So for example, if different kind of boundary condition of nut tightening or bolt tightening I want to apply, I can directly apply on it, right? So this is a model, as you might see, it's a quite complex model. And if you are trying to solve this model, it will take, you know, quite a lot of time. First, you need to simplify it. Then you need to put the boundary condition and check if it's running or not. And the mesh is also a tedious task in this kind of a model. This model I've directly downloaded from the you know, OEM site. So nothing has been altered. It is a perfect model. Now I'll show you how easy it is to just, you know, simulate within uh, Altair uh, SimSolid. So I'll just quickly go ahead and initially just give the material conditions. Let's say uh, I want it to be aluminum. I'll apply this to all parts and that's it. Now, now creating connection is also a TTS task. And you might see the total number of components that we have in here is 
about uh, 68 right and getting these connections might be quite difficult and time consuming but over here i can just click a button and give the tolerance for the gap or penetration and just click okay and it will try to get the connections for all the parts within that model so when you go in in there so there are two type of connection fast enough and regular connection so if they want to change any kind of connection i can go in there and change the type of connection as well right so now i'll just move along and try to set up a let's say a model analysis we'll just go into the model analysis and just give the number of modes and set up the boundary conditions for the support right let's say i want to uh, get support at the base in here so i'll just select this surface this surface and this surface and click okay right once i'm done i can move out and just click on solve right so now it will be go along and try to solve uh, on this very model so what it does uh, within the component the sim solid just you know create a single mesh so for example there is one component over here it will consider this as a single element and try to solve a complex mathematical equations over it now after solving it try to identify the error with respect to a boundary condition if the error is above a threshold point it again goes on and try to you know create more number of mesh inside this element inside this body and then again solve it it keeps on doing so unless and until the error is quite small and the solution we reach is you know quite accurate so it has evaluated the connections and all now i can just go ahead and see the result and just tap in here so we have displacements we can view animations as well so it took about just a minute or two just set up the model and run the analysis all the different frequencies apart from this we also have model participation factor so let's say i want to have a look at the model participation factor i can click in here and uh, have a look at the histogram in which mode where the participation is the highest we can also have the effective mass same this data can be exported as a csv file as well if i want to take it outside and you know do some kind of calculation of that sort i can take it that as well so uh, let's say i have done with my analysis what if say i make some iteration in the uh, given cad model then do i need to you know again go and set up the all the conditions currently there is just uh, one condition that we have applied right uh, one load case that is of the model analysis what say there are number of cases in our static analysis dynamic analysis do i need to set up all those analysis again and again no it's not the case so i can just insert the cat file again it will go and try to find out the different elements that are there in the cat file and try to connect the uh, load cases from the initial design study to over here so i can just again set up the connections for this case and rest all the conditions for the model analysis are being fetched from the initial baseline solution again i can just uh, give the material let's see aluminum again in this case and just click solve that's it so i haven't gone through you know setting up the model again and again i've just inserted the model with a slight different you know configuration and i i'm able to solve it again it will just bifurcate a body into single mesh try to solve a complex mathematical equation over it and if the error is above a threshold uh, then it again adds some degrees of freedom again element uh, add more element within the solid so yeah now we are done i can just again have a look at the displacements what are the displacements what are the different frequencies and even say if i just want animation i can have those animation as well i can also side by side compare right so what are the frequency changes so for over here it's 1.3 e raised to power 1 and in this case it's about 1.2 right 
right? So I can side by side compare as well. So within very short duration of time, without you know uh, solving the mesh, without uh, going through and simplifying the model, I'm able to solve this model. And it can be quite tedious if you are using a regular SPA software to solve this kind of a complex model, right? So this was uh, a kind of an analysis that we did on the robotic model, and this was a model that was fetched directly from uh, our OEM library, right? What if say you are in a conceptual phase, right? You are designing a robot uh, in house, and you are in just in a conceptual phase, and you want to optimize that model and play around with it, right? So I'll again just quickly go ahead and share my screen for you. Okay, so this is the software it's called in Altair Inspire, right? So Inspire is a uh, very UI friendly uh, interface in which uh, we are able to set up motion analysis and do optimization of a different solid if we want to, right? So let's say you have a conceptual model. So I'll just quickly go ahead and load up a conceptual model. So we have different kind of files that can be inputted into Altair Inspire, right? So these all files can be taken in. So I'll just quickly go ahead and add a parasolid file. Right. So this is a conceptual robotic model that I have in my hand. So there is no optimization in here. I do not know what will be the specification of my motor that I will be putting in that uh, robot. So with just this conceptual design within Inspire, I'll be able to find out all those things, right? So I'll just go ahead and just auto color so that I can see all the components separately. Okay. So. Now let's run a motion analysis, right? So the workflow is simple, right? I need to move from left to right, and the you know all the complications, all the joints, uh, all the motors I can put on, right? So from left, I'll be starting with grounds. If I have the ground or the rigid groups, then joints one by one, I'll be moving along and I'll be analyzing it. I'll just quickly go ahead and uh, insert the joint. So as I just click on joint, it has automatically identified what are the places in which joints can be inserted. So I just need not to go and specify the places where I need to insert the joint. It will automatically detect, and by the click of a button, it will insert the joints in those early positions. Yeah, so the joints have been created. Say I want to change the behavior of any joint, I can just go over to the very joint and just change the behavior, say, to logged from active. We also have similar feature in a browser. So within the model browser, I can go in and I can just change the specification of a joint or something, right? So over here, it's a cylindrical joint. Let's say I want to change it to hinge. I can do so from that very uh, property manager, right? So now let's move on to insert the motors. I can just place a motor at the bottom to rotate the robot. So I'll just put in over here, just that's it. I can now specify what kind of rotation do I want? Do I want angular acceleration? Do I want to put in the angular rotation? So I'll be putting uh, the angular rotation. I'll be putting a function. Let's say you want to insert a specific function uh, through which the motor will be evolving, right? So I can import a CSV file or I can select a predefined function that we have within the library of uh, inspire. Yeah, so this is a function that I have been imported. And I can just, you know, the motor will be behaving in a similar fashion. I can move out of the tool. Again, I can just go and insert another motion uh, uh, by inserting the motor at the joint. Just click over it. This motor will be inserted again. I can just give the condition what kind of movement I want to uh, that motor to present. There are different functions that can be put on this motor. Yeah, I, then I can move out of the tool. Right. So one more motor I just need to insert. Again, just give the conditions. And I can move out of the tool. Again, I can just, if say, I want to alter any functionality of the motor, I can just go into the model browser and within the model browser, I'm able to alter. Yeah. 
okay so let's say i want to reverse the condition of the motor or i just want to change anything i can do so easily from the model browser so it's quite easy so it's not tedious you know setting up the motor setting up the conditions you are not worrying about mesh in here quite simple and sleek you are just uh, what you are thinking in your mind you are placing it on the model right so that's the user interface it's quite friendly i can change the settings let's say i want the start time from 0.25 to dwell time to increase by 0.5 seconds i can alter those very conditions as well quite easily once i am done i can just quickly go ahead and run a motion simulation and see if i am lagging somewhere or not right so with the initial only i am able to know that there is something wrong i have not processed for an hour or so and then came to know that there was something wrong in the initial only i know there is something wrong i need to go and fix it so i know as it is falling i need to create a grounding condition over here so i'll just quickly click on the uh, body and just select the grounding condition from there again i can run the motion analysis and depending upon the input from the motor the arms will be rotating right okay once i am good to go i can also add tracer right so tracer will identify where the arm is moving along right so i'll have a data of uh, what are the points that the arm will be covering if uh, the condition that i've given to the motor are met So again, if say I want to fetch any information about any joints and all, I can do those as well. So here is the data of the path that the trajectory that the arm will be following. I can save this uh, video as well, right? So now, uh, let's say I want to see what are the torque that is acting on the motor. Okay. so this was the conceptual design i wasn't aware how the movement will be i wasn't aware what kind of specification of the motor i need to take but over here with this simulation i am able to know what is the maximum torque that is required right so the maximum torque is minus 5 newton per meter to have similar kind of motion so i have the basic idea when i'll be you know uh, searching for motor i need to uh, make sure that these specification are met so similarly i can fetch the information of all the motors in here with respect to torque and different parameters so currently it's minus 5.12 newton per meter so i can make sure that i have the motor of the similar capacity let's say i want to add a weight that will be acting on the arm in here so i can just quickly go ahead and select the mass and select the surface to which i want it to be attached i can move it along Let's say 10 kg of mass. Just move it along a bit, and just connect to that very surface. Right. So the condition of you know uh, the arm holding a body or something will be simulated with the uh, distance mass. And just go back and again just click on play, and the motion simulation will run. now again the, as the mass is attached over there the condition that will be required for the motor will change right the torque requirement will change now so if i just double click over here i see that the torque requirement has been increased from minus 5.12 to about about minus 30 right so with respect to the different kind of you know objects that i'm picking with the robot i am able to know what kind of specification i need with, uh, of my motor i can also have the you know forces that are acting on the joints on the hinges right so i'm making sure those are also designed in a perfect manner so these are the forces that are acting on the joints again i can fetch this information i can take the information out as a csv file and use it for you know different purpose say for calculation or something like that now comes the optimization part right so these were the arms that i just you know created just like this now i want these designs to be optimized so that uh, there i'm not inserting a more material or you know the part is perfectly optimized with respect to the loading condition that i put forward uh, this uh, part to be in 
So I can just select it at the design space, go to optimize part, and just select what is my target, right? What is my objective? Is my objective to maximize stiffness, maximize frequency, or minimize mass, right? So currently, let's say I'm, uh, I want this, you know, uh, arm to move as sleek as possible, as fast as possible, and so my main objective over here is to minimize the mass. So you can just go on and just tap on minimize mass. Just give the uh, minimum factor of safety. I can just run it. So it took about a few uh, minutes to do so. So I've just created a file out of it. I'll just open up that file to show what kind of you know motion simulation if we run what kind of shape that will be getting. So the model is loading up. So the optimization happens depending upon the load part, right? That's all. We were trying to identify what are the load parts through which the load is being carried. In those, uh, from those load parts, it creates certain kind of element, right? So over here, I can see that it has created uh, the elements where the load has been carried. So removing the mass from the areas which are insignificant. Once uh, I find that this is uh, perfectly fine with my goal, I can go along and create polynuffs out of it and create a perfect solid out of it. I can also save as, save this thing as an STP or IGS file and take it out for another CAD software to work upon. Right. I'll just go ahead and load up a file in which I have already created a uh, clean geometry out of it. Okay, so this is the final optimized shape that I have I have got uh, using polynuffs in which you know I've just created and rounded those edges and created a sleek shape so that I can you know clearly print or something like that. Now with this thing over here, I can just again quickly go ahead and run the simulation and see how this part is acting right now, right? I can have a motion simulation in here. Just have an overview how my part will be behaving. The similar conditions. As well as I can see, you know, motor outputs and also analyze my part as well. So let's say I just want to analyze the uh, arm over here. I can just quickly go ahead and run a solution over here. And uh, when the solution run is completed, I can just fetch the information about the uh, behavior of this valley arm. So I've already done it. So I'll just click over here and I can hover. I can see what kind of displacements are happening over that solid. And it's moving along. I can have the information about the factor of safety. I can have the information about the shear stress. And I also can compare these results, right? I can compare these results from the original part that I had initially. So as the mass has been reduced, the displacement might increase a bit, but it is an optimized shape. So we aren't you know, placing uh, unnecessary material in the, in the component, and we are making sure that the arm speed is accurate and you know uh, there is no latency as well because the weight has been reduced significantly over here and down. So Matthew, I guess I have one question regarding, uh, let me see. Yeah, my question is, uh, what you presented is mostly when you want to design a robot. Uh, I don't know for the others, but in our case, we're only using the robot that is designed by either ABB, Fennec, or UR, or anything else. Basically, what we do is we do everything except the robot. Okay. All right. But is there something uh, uh, for the the tooling itself, like how it gonna react on the tool of the robot, like how it's like how can I say that? If we 
put the robot on a, a, a frame or a base, mm -hmm. and you put a tooling at the other end, like, is there something we can do? Yeah, that could you be more specific. Or... Could you be more specific, Matthew? Like, Messier, like, what what would you want to do with the end effector? We have clients that do this, but what yes. what, what, what would you want to do with the end effector? Uh, basically, this uh, mostly um, what you want to have is when there's an e stop or there's a well, mostly it's the e stop, which is like the worst case scenario. Like, what are the constraints that's going to be on the base? And also, um, it's the natural frequency that we need to look into. But I'm not sure if we need to add the robot or not to put the robot on the base. The, Still a question I have. An e-stop, yeah. So an e-stop scenario, it is a shock event. Yep. So basically like you could do some rudimentary um, like modal analysis, like for example, like just to get things started. And then currently and then, what we, well, I, I can tell you like what we do now and maybe it's enough. So, that's why I'm asking. Um, what we do is uh, the the robot suppliers give us numbers. Like when there's an e-stop, it's gonna apply a torque and forces on the base. So basically, I report everything down to the base, and then I just put them there. Like on uh, sometimes there's three, sometimes there's four place where the robot sits. So I distribute the load, and that's it. But as far as frequency, I'm I'm not I, I did both, but I'm still not sure which one I should use with or without the robot when I'm talking about frequency. Like if there's gonna be resonance or something like that. Or maybe I'm deep diving too much. Well so, so let's be specific. Like let's talk end effector first, right? So you're you're mentioning the end effector. An end effector um Basically, if you're talking about an e-stop scenario, that's a shock event. That's like a pulse pulse event. In a shock event, um, there are ways where basically you can do a modal analysis on the different components and then figure out um, if the pulse event that you're having during e-stop is within the frequency range of your end effector. Now typically like with your end effector being so small, the resonance frequency is gonna be relatively high. So you could do a resonance frequency of your end effector itself and then compare it with the resonant frequencies basically being transferred through the robotic arm and then do a comparison. A larger scenario is in the Inspire, um, in the Inspire Altera suite, you could actually do an actual input pulse event inside the end effector, making an estimate of the transfer through the arm into your end effector and do different pulse scenarios on the e-stop. And, and if, with that response, you could try different scenarios and see if the end effector is going to be um, strong enough. Now, I can tell you, like, you know, um, you know, the end effector is going to be relatively light compared to the rest of the assembly. So the likelihood of an e-stop causing breakage, I would think, would be low, except in the event it was holding load. And when you're talking about the end effector... Like the hand, like the hand. Like, like okay, the, it's the hand, yeah. Yeah, like the hand. Like the end effect, that's so the yeah. So so the end effector of of the of the robot is going to, you know, see um, inputs from the sh that specific shock event. Typically, when you're doing resonance analysis, and we can talk about this offline if you like, Metzier, is there's two scenarios. There's either your standard resonance frequency input, which are basically like 
long-term amplification or there's single events like a shock event. In a shock event, that's a different type of scenario to analyze, but in, in, a, in a simple scenario, you do a modal analysis and then you basically compare the resonance frequencies. In a longer scenario, you'd basically, um, uh, you, do, you do an actual response analysis with the software you currently have. Okay. So, so, so you would do an input, input shock scenario analysis. The problem with going with off the shelf like product, like, you know, because I've done design for many years, I did design for many years, um, is they're giving you general guidance, but that general guidance is not really that accurate. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's kind of yeah. like taking a, a I'm trying to think of another example, like, it's like saying, you know, it's saying you take like a, a, a computer chip and then they give you general guidance as, as to how much airflow should go across the computer chip. That's not a real, that's not a, that, that's a rough way of like getting, getting, um, getting the values, but like, it's not really the, it's not really what, what you know, if you're doing proper, um, investigation, you really want to get in the specifics and do more, you know, more testing, um, you know, so for, for example, some scenarios you might want to do is maybe, um, characterize, um, by doing testing, like, like, um, vibrations analysis on the robotic arm. That would be okay. one scenario. Yeah, but, but um, you know, so that way you can get like actual characterized inputs so you can do validation um, on your, on your, um, on your models. But yeah, it's, it, I mean, that, the, to be honest, like this stuff is, is like, it's complicated. Like it's not simple. Yeah. It's not simple. Okay. Um, so maybe I want to go too much. Yeah, it's okay. These are good we questions. We don't have like, any breakage are, yet. So. Yeah, these are things that I think like we would have to d discuss more offline because it's a deep topic. It's a deep yep. topic. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess there is one more question from uh, Yimin. Uh, can you please unmute yourself and you know please describe your question if you don't mind. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, after you after you did the optimization, uh, yeah. can you show the new talk versus? That's speed, right? Speed or, or time? I, I, I don't uh, remember. I, I want to say if there is any loss in the in the in the torque levels. Mm -hmm. Torque and all, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll just share my screen once. Okay. So. Okay. So as the mass have been reduced significantly, right? So the yes. torque is also also being reduced a bit, right? Because actually it's moving around uh, the mass, right? If the mass reduces, the torque requirement will also be, you know, go down a bit. So it means you need more torque, right? So once the, uh, if you just, you know, uh, reduce the mass, optimize uh, the solid, the torque requirement will decrease, right? Yes. You understand? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Because the load on the motors will reduce. Oh. Okay. 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 Yes. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes, correct. I just I just show you a simple model over here. I I remember before you before you did the optimization, you checked a a curve plotted in blue, a blue curve, a blue yeah. torque curve. It, it something. Yeah. yeah. So this is a different model. So over here you have the you know torque graph that we have with respect to our time as the motor will be moving. I've taken a simple model so that we can be able to understand, right? So when I'll be playing it, it'll be showing you with the time how the torque is varying on the motor, right? As the load on the motor will decrease, the torque requirement will also be decreasing. Okay. I, I actually, uh, yeah. actually yeah. what I meant was I, I want to say the the talk the talk plot be, be before optimization and after optimization yeah so uh, this talk graph you can just export as csv or as an image or as a plot right so once you have an csv you can uh, easily compare it side by side okay 
Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, and they are different. Apart from torque, you have angle, speed, angular jerk, power output of the motor. Those all things are also there. Right. Okay. Even though if you are inside. Setting... The... Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, when you're setting a motor, can you set the 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 torque available from the motor, or it's always the required torque for the motion? Actually, it's the required torque of the motion, right? We are not, okay. you know, setting up the, you know, the upper limit of the torque. We are just inserting the motor and seeing for this kind of uh, movement, what kind of torque requirement do we need? Okay. Let's say uh, if you're inserting some kind of a spring or something, you can also have the data from that thing as well. So, what are the forces that are acting on the spring or the damper? What is the acceleration, spring displacement? All these information can also be fetched out. So you know, so uh, for creating this very you know uh, pore bar mechanism, what kind of spring you need, what land it will be you know compressing, and all those information will be having first hand. Yeah. So okay. any more questions? Okay, thanks. So uh. Before leaving, please make sure you are, you know, just giving a feedback on the webinar. I've just posted the link uh, on the chat window. We'll be waiting for a couple of more questions if you have any. Hey, I will just add, you can, you can input a defined torque um, with the function builders to create yeah. the uh, input from a robot to see what the speed will be as a result. So you don't have to use a motor in that case. You could actually input the torque directly that you have from the robot or from the motor that you're using. Okay, so if I just share uh, my screen over here, right? So that so would be motor? from the function couplers or, or oh, directly yeah, in the motor? So okay. We can uh, you know input different kind of things from here. So you can give the okay, angle, you can give the angular rotation, angular acceleration or even the torque as well right torque if you say you want to have certain kind of a graph you can select the graph as well so let's say you want that function to be uh, just step or step dwell or single wave the kind of function that you want you can put insert it in here or if say you want to create your own function you have a csv file out of it you can create your own function as well you can you know convert to table and you can just uh, import your csv file even if you don't have a CSV file, you can alter these points as well, right? You can alter these points in the graph over here. Right. So input for the motor. Question? Does this answer your question? Yes, perfectly. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know about that uh, feature. Perfect. Yeah. So you can either uh, vary the motion of the motor with respect to the angle, or the speed, or the acceleration, or the torque. And for that also, you can have a preset function that we have in here, or you can just export your own CSV file if you have any. Yeah, any more questions? We'll be also sending out a, you know, a recording of this session. Even after the session, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be you know, happy to answer your questions or any queries that you will be having. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Thank you very much. You're very, you're very welcome.